Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to our live event today, our uh, Safe Spaces for White Questions. Um, I'm here with my colleague and comrade, uh, troublemaker in arms, uh, Dr. Ajay Parasaram, and I'm Alex Kasnabish. Uh, if you've been along with us uh, on this journey for the last couple of iterations, uh, you know, this has become our, our regular event. And if you're new, uh, great as well. Welcome. Uh, we are doing this online right now, obviously, as a result of the pandemic. Um, this is our second online event. Our very first uh, Safe Spaces event was a live event at Dow back in the days when we were uh, doing such things pre-COVID. Uh, amazing that there was such a time, but this is uh, this is our new format and we hope you're uh, able to join us in this. If not, uh, maybe you're watching this video later on. In that case, um, great, and uh, hopefully you can join us live next time we do this. We are planning on monthly events from here on out, so please pay attention uh, to the Facebook event uh, postings as well, which will always include the link for these events. Um, and uh, feel free to reach out with your questions, of course, as well, which is how we try to organize these things. Uh, so uh, without any further ado, let's get going. I'm just going to uh, introduce our uh, myself and then throw it over to Ajay uh, to introduce himself and the rest of the team as well. Uh, first of all, I'd like to begin by acknowledging this event and indeed our lives here are taking place on unceded, unsurrendered Mi'kmaq territory. And for all of those uh, who, like me, are settlers watching this live event. Um, I want to acknowledge our collective responsibility to decolonize our lives and our presences here and to learn to live with justice and dignity with the first inhabitants of these territories. Um, so uh, just a quick intro to me, if you don't know who I am. Uh, my name is Alex Kasnabish. I'm a professor of sociology and anthropology at Mount St. Vincent University. I am a settler on these territories. I am, I like to refer to myself as an ambiguously racialized person, uh, meaning that sometimes I pass for white in this society and other times I am more visibly uh, different, other. Um, I come originally from the Haudenosaunee territories in, in present-day Ontario. I was born and raised in Toronto, but have lived uh, here in Halifax for the last 14 years. Um, and this work is uh, is very connected to uh, the political and academic work that I've been doing for uh, quite some time now, and I'm so happy to be here uh, talking with all of you and uh, addressing these questions at this critical moment where we're grappling with issues of white supremacy, uh, racial fragility, and racial justice. And uh, without any more from me, I think I'll pass it over to Ajay to introduce himself and to the rest of the team as well. Thank you, Alex, and hello, everyone. Thanks again for tuning in. And uh, like Alex said, welcome if this is your first time with us. Uh, I'm Ajay Parasram, and I'm a multi-generational transnational byproduct of the British Empire, by which I mean, uh, you know, my ancestors came originally from India. They crossed uh, the Atlantic Ocean, ended up as unintentional uh, scab laborers in a really hostile racial kind of uh, economic nexus in the Southern Caribbean and uh, ultimately moving and, and growing up across Turtle Island here in Mi'kma'ki, uh, in Coast Salish territories and uh, in Algonquin territories as well. So um, that's basically all I want to say about myself. Uh, and um, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Courtney to introduce herself. Hello everyone, my name is Courtney Law. I'm a white settler here and I'm a graduate student at Dalhousie's Department of International Development Studies, and I am Professor Paris Ram's research assistant. I will be moderating the Q&A behind the scenes here, and I look forward to learning along with, with all of our listeners. And oh, I'm going to pass it on to Liam Caswell. <laughs> oh, you're, 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 oh, Liam, your mic. Mute, Liam, you're muted still. I don't know if he can hear us. <laughs> I was muted. Well, yeah. not <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Liam Caswell. I am a PhD student in the history department under Dr. Ajay Parasaram. Um, I am also the feed supervisor, and hopefully that's the only one 
kind of uh, hiccup that happens during my tenure as such. Um, I am a descendant of a long line of settlers in Mi'kma'ki, um, and I really enjoyed the previous discussions um, during these events, and I'm looking forward to hearing what happens uh, this time around. So uh, with that, I'll pass you over to Dr. Kasnabish. Thanks, Liam, and thanks uh, everyone uh, for introducing yourselves. So folks, um, if you've been with us before, you know how the rest of this works, um, but just a quick intro to it. We're happy to take your questions as they come in. We've had some questions submitted uh, by various means through Facebook, through email uh, before the event started, and they're going to come up in our live event Q&A. I'm going to take uh, the first uh, question here and just read it out loud and then uh, take a shot at um, uh, addressing it before I pass it over to Ajay for his thoughts on that. We're just going to go back and forth um, reading the questions until our time with you today runs out. So, um, and then we'll just have to wait for the next one. So uh, let's get right to it. Our first question uh, is, uh, how do I explain to someone that no, racism against white people doesn't actually exist? Some people I know refuse to see a difference between racial prejudice and racism. Uh, it's a great question. Um, uh, we get this a lot. It's it's one of um, the most common questions I think I actually address in class. And you know, most of my classes um, are majority white folks. So uh, this is a popular question and a uh, a prickly one too, because I think we all know at some at some point in our lives we've been on the receiving end of generalizations, negative generalizations about our identity in some form, whether that's our class. Uh, our socioeconomic class, our the color of our skin or our racialized identity, our age or ability, um, our sexual identity and our gender, any number of things, right? So uh, people understand what it's like to feel dehumanized, and that's real. And I'm, 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 we're certainly not suggesting that it's impossible for white people not to feel um, uh, prejudiced against or or to be discriminated against or to be dehumanized even. But I think this is one of the questions that's really super important to dig into um, because it's where like our language has gotten a bit a bit sloppy and a bit slippery in it. This isn't just an academic question. It's a question of how we address a big uh, phenomena in in our society, right? Like what's the difference between certain kinds of experiences of inequality and injustice? And this isn't just an academic question, it's a question of how we get to the root of things and ultimately how we build a better collectively liberated society. So I'll begin with a bit of a, a popular uh, statement, a bit of a cliche, which is that um, white people's lives can certainly be hard, but in a society that's fundamentally white supremacist, none of those lives are hard because of their whiteness. Uh, and that's an important realization, I think, for those of us, and I, again, I identified myself as an ambiguously racialized person to start this event. Um, there are times where I clearly benefit, for example, in the society for sort of passing as, as white. And there are times where I stand out more clearly, often in the summertime when I have more of a tan, sometimes when people read my last name, often when people ask me where my, my people come from, uh, and that difference is marked as significant, right? Sometimes in treatment, in treatment by different institutions, these kinds of things. And it's at those moments that I think it's important for us to acknowledge that we're not living in some imagined sort of like frictionless flat space where everybody experiences the world in the same kinds of ways. Obviously, we know because of the, the conditions of our, of our existence, what we commonly call like our identities, right? We're able to navigate institutions and relationships differently, right? Um, so I'm sure you can imagine if you were an indigenous person a couple of decades ago living on, on reserve and you were unable to leave your reserve because you required a pass from the Indian agent who was most likely to be a white person, who was there to issue you a pass at their discretion, that made your ability to move around this society dramatically different than somebody who is a white settler here who didn't have those conditions. Maybe that white settler has terrible life experiences otherwise. Maybe they're dehumanized in their job, exploited, treated shabbily by their boss, 
a victim of, of, of violence on the street. All those things can be true, but simply by virtue of their identity, their racialized identity, they're not in the same place as another person who is clearly legally and structurally uh, discriminated against by that system. So, um, I mean, we can say a lot more. I'm sure AJ is going to have things to weigh in on here, but I'd like to give you a quick and dirty uh, definition of racism that I like to use uh, often in my classes, but also in my in my political and activist work, uh, just as something to think about, about why white people can't be victims of racism in our society right now. So racism for me, drawing on the work of lots of anti-racist scholars is a system of oppression, of oppressive social relations rooted in the spurious conviction that humanity can be divided into distinct and unequal groups based on arbitrary observable characteristics like skin color with implications for who counts as fully human and who doesn't. And I think that that definition for me works because it identifies some of the most common ways we divide people into races and no scientist, no anthropologist, no geneticist would agree that there is something, that there's such a thing as distinct human races, first of all. Uh, there's only one human species, that's the human race that we talk about colloquially. Your skin color is an extremely changeable feature of your human existence, right? So to divide us up along those lines is immediately, uh, is, is silly in a certain kind of way. But of course we know it's not silly because that distinction has been used to discriminate against and to oppress and exploit very specific groups of people. Now whites can be that group and in an alternative universe somewhere, undoubtedly that system exists. But in our world, in our system, that's not how the history is played out. That doesn't mean white people are the devil. That means that whites have been complicit and have been beneficiaries of large scale social systems that have actually done great violence to other groups of people and that have tended to benefit them as a group more often than not. Again, it doesn't mean that your life can't be hard or difficult as a white person, but it means that your life isn't hard because you're white. And I think that's the critical difference around race. But I'm going to pass it over to Ajay now for his comments on this too. I'm sure he has lots to say about it. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I agree. This is definitely one of the questions that we get most often. Um, and I don't really have anything intellectually to add to what Alex said. I, I agree with everything that he said. So maybe what I'll just spend a minute or two on is talking about kind of like politically strat political strategy of how you might advance an argument like this when you find it, whether it's at, you know, like the dinner table or up at a pub or hanging out with your friends or something. The first thing I would say a question like this uh, is you need to disarm the person who's asking the question. Uh, and I like to do that with humor whenever possible. So, uh, you know, I like to start when this comes up in my classes with, listen, you know, a black person, indigenous person, person of color, yeah, they can't be racist against white people because they don't have, you know, hundreds of years of systemic privilege on the basis of their skin. It doesn't mean that they can't be assholes. You know, there's all kinds of us that are just total jerks beyond all imagination. I'm not here to try and tell you that there's something, you know, unique or special or wonderful about, uh, you know, uh, BIPOC people. Like, we're, we're just people, like Alex was saying. Uh, and, and the real critical difference to draw your friend's attention to is that it's a question of structure and history. And, and as Alex already explained, um, you know, BIPOC people have never been systematically advantaged because of the color of their skin. Uh, and any kind of like, you know, whether it's like equity movements or attempts to try and address uh, systemic discrimination is not actually, you know, it's not a form of, of privileging. It's a form of uh, addressing the systematic uh, inequities and systematic problems of the various institutions. So you can even preempt the next argument about, well, you know, this is a diversity hire or something like that. Preempt it by saying, no, that's trying to fix a structural deficiency. So hopefully that helps. And um, yeah, I'll pass it back to you, Alex, to weigh in on the next question. We have a few in there now. Thanks, AJ. Uh, yeah, I mean, great way to start off for sure. Let's let's get right to the next one. Um, I would like some input about black people appearing to speak against black rights, such as Candace Owens said George Floyd is no hero, and Cash Lee Kelly, who talked about black people being more violent against each other. It seems some white people think black people can't be anti-black or women can't be anti-feminist. Thoughts? Sorry for my long-winded questions. First of all, no need to apologize. It's a great question. Appreciate the context. 
Uh, yeah, it's it is a. I mean, in all honesty, I'm just speaking from uh, from personal uh, perspective here, I find this uh, like a deeply vexing thing to deal with. Just and the examples you cite are excellent. Just like I find women who express anti-feminist perspectives troubling. I mean, it's it's for me to be totally honest. It's equivalent to folks being kind of like complicit in their own oppression, um, which bothers me. Right? I think like that. That's something that. Uh, lots of scholars, uh, lots of revolutionaries and radicals have written about about this, like the inter the work that uh, oppressed people often do in internalizing uh, a system of oppression so that they can kind of like reconcile their existence with the world. And I think, you know, on my more charitable days, this is where I try to go with it, right? Imagining how it is for every oppressed group, whether we're talking about queer folks, gender non-conforming folks, we're talking about indigenous people, we're talking about black folks or BIPOC in general. I mean, how, how do you reconcile your existence with a world that seems to regard you as less worthy and less than human? And some people do that by organizing and trying to change that, that awful system and other Folks do it by reconciling themselves and trying to make peace with it. And I think to some degree we can talk about this question of whether it's false consciousness, right? This kind of internalization of like the master's rules, more or less. I think some of that is 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 going on for sure. But to come back to the point that AJ was just making too, some people are are savvy political movers and shakers and understand that there's money and privilege to be made and and like gains to be had by advancing those those like counterintuitive struggles. I think in, to some extent, some of the people you're citing obviously have made fairly lucrative careers out of being the token minority on Fox News or in you know the the National Post or whatever, who who advocate for positions that work against the people that they seem to represent. And I think this is why we're doing this kind of event. And it's why AJ and I do a lot of the work that we do, because what we want to do is bring attention to the fact that this isn't about some kind of internal essence, like, oh, I was born into the world with a vagina, so I must be feminist. No, like that doesn't make you feminist. A feminist is a political position to occupy on those issues that seeks liberation for an oppressed group in an oppressive system, right? It seeks to dismantle patriarchy in order to advance women's rights in that context, right? So these are positions we come to. And I think uh, what we need to do is recognize that just like there are poor people who regularly believe in the capitalist myths of, of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. And, you know, if I work hard enough, suffer long enough, I'm going to make it. You know, our whole society is kind of a testament to the utility of those myths in the service of ruling class domination of the rest of us. And so it like in a way, it should not be a surprise that we find all kinds of folks from all sorts of marginalized and oppressed groups who are willing to advance those arguments. So in large part, that, that's how I would address it as, as profoundly disappointing, as, as obviously wrongheaded, as no more convincing than if, let's say, a Tucker Carlson, a shrill white guy, is screaming about the same kinds of positions online. I certainly give it no more credence simply because it's coming from a person who seems to embody some of the identity characteristics of their given community. I mean, the question I would ask, too, is how accepted is that person amongst members of their own community in an authentic way after a while too. We can have lots of representatives who, who claim to represent those communities who are not necessarily seen as authentic, authentic members of those communities precisely because they work against those interests. So great question, probably a bit of a rambling answer. I'm going to pass it over to AJ for his thoughts on this one too. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Alex. Um, you know, the, the the thing that I would want to say on this question is is again to reiterate that no one speaks with one voice. Uh, no large community can be expected to speak with one voice. I would also share like, you know, I haven't looked into the details of it, but I heard on the news recently that Ice Cube, uh, you know, is is like supporting Trump. And as a longstanding Ice Cube uh, fan, that, that hurt me in my heart to hear that he was supporting Trump. And I haven't had the nerve to go and read about it yet. Um, but yeah, you know, th these things happen and you, we have to be willing to assume that 
you know, not just white people, but in fact, all people uh, have a huge diversity of views and perspectives for a variety of different reasons, many of which Alex outlined. Um, and, and the one thing I would add to that, and, and this is related to why we are doing this kind of activity, is that, you know, racialized people, BIPOC people, they're all in different places in their own processes of dealing with uh, the trauma of, of, of living in a white supremacist society. So people will see, um, it's, and that's not different from other forms, like structural forms of violence, like patriarchy or what have you. Um, they see rewards uh, for acting and, and responding in a certain way and they react accordingly. That's not to condescendingly say, well, no, like the, nobody can have that a view. Like they may very well have that view, you know, like uh, highly influential people, intelligent people are entitled to whatever they think, regardless of whether or not Alex or I agree with them. But the only point I want to say is that why we uh, make a space like this is so that we can take some attention away from you know, like the handful of black or indigenous or Indian people who uh, are kind of visually and publicly siding with uh, structural white supremacy, take the attention away from that, so that you know, BIPOC people, BIPOC young people, um, what have you, can go through their own process of processing the kind of intergenerational trauma and figuring out for themselves what living free from racism means to them. And I think that if you go back and you talk to somebody who might espouse views like that, you know, this year, and you talk to them 10 years from now, their opinion will likely have evolved and matured. Um, so that's all I'd say to that. I think we can move on to the next question, Alex. All right, um, moving right along here. Um, so our next question. Hi, thank you for this event. I'm a white male who grew up in a family that made lots of jokes about black people. I do have black friends and really don't consider myself racist. However, how can I become anti-racist in my personal and professional life? Uh, another another great question. Um, and thanks for the willingness to, you know, uh, share some of your biography there too. I think this is an experience that many of us have. And uh, again, just, it, you know, being completely honest, I, I feel grateful that I grew up at a time uh, before social media and the ubiquitous uh, uh, camera phone, <laughs> because I think we've all made terrible mistakes <laughs> and and said things that we, we wished we hadn't, especially when we were young and experimented with like forms of communication and, and ways of being that we'd be kind of grossed out by, by now. So I hear all of that. And, and I think none of us come from families or or like friend or kin groups that are free from this stuff. It's like really, um, you know, in so many ways, like this is this is the work that we need to be doing at the, you know, like to deal with institutions and kind of big processes in society is one thing, but it's often this like everyday racism that we can both have an effect over and is the way that it's like nurtured and reproduced in so many ways. So I guess I would say like, first of all, to your question that by asking the question to some extent, you're already on your path to being a bona fide anti-racist, right? You clearly care and are concerned about these issues. You're identifying things in your own history that make you uncomfortable and that you recognize as wrong now. And that's great. That's like, that's the process of personal transformation, right? I guess I would continue to say, or I would say that you need to continue to push that, right? That um, certainly it's it's not enough to sort of say, well, I have, you know, racialized people in my life now, so I'm, I'm better than I used to be. Um, you're not collecting sh seashells on the beach. Uh, these people are, are people in your life. And uh, need to be treated like in that way, right? So are there things I suppose that you feel you continue to do that play into those dynamics that are familiar to you from your from your earlier life, right? So you're not making openly racist jokes anymore, it seems, and I'm glad to hear that and I hope. Um, are you still tolerating them in the in the context of family or or friend gatherings, for example? Like um, you know, are there are there are there ways of communicating stereotypes, caricatures that are regularly traded in that that you kind of passively participate in or, or let happen, right? I mean, in your personal life, these are often the places I think where we can make some real inroads, right? Not simply by trying to demonstrate that we are individually committed to anti-racism, but also that we're willing to sort of do the work with people we love and care about to help wean them off of those toxic relationships too. Um, 
in terms of your professional life, I, I mean, I don't know what you do as a profession, but I would say all of us obviously work within, I work in the university. I consider the university certainly a white supremacist place, even when it speaks, sometimes especially when it speaks most strongly in terms of its anti-racist credentials. So I think there are a whole lot of things we can do. And I, I really don't want to take up too much time in this conversation. I want to pass this over to AJ for his thoughts, but I guess I would just offer a couple of things. Um, each of us works in a particular space and works amongst people in, in some kind of way, right? Some of us are more independent and autonomous than others. But in those spaces, do you notice these dynamics being propagated, right? Even either informally, and often people will talk about office culture, you know, being either misogynist or or homophobic or racist, right? In the kinds of jokes and stories that get circulated in the in the in the in the in the ways that people communicate and act in the office. Are there things that you are noticing? And if you're not noticing, could you pay attention maybe a little bit more to the way that other people experience what passes for regular culture in your space and place and be kind of attentive to that? There's so much we can do as individuals to make sure that the everyday spaces that we occupy are not propagating racist violence against other people who we share that space with. And I think just one other quick point I would make, pay attention to who does what kind of work in the space you're occupying. So it's a cliche that, you know, for example, women workers in any workplace are often uh, expected to do uh, the social work, the social networking, the party planning, the the extra, you know, keeping the office a, a, like a friendly and convivial place um, that often racialized people are expected to do a disproportionate share of unwanted or thankless or sometimes like outright kind of dirty work, right? So who's cleaning the fridge in your office? Who's cleaning the toilets? Who's who's sweeping the floors? Are there ways of addressing some of that that inequity, right? Just at a really basic level. I think people want to start huge all the time and that's understandable, but sometimes the most effective work we can do in our own circles really revolves around that. And I won't say any more. I'll pass it over to AJ for his thoughts. Thanks, Alex, and thanks thanks for that question. It's I think it's a really important question. Um, and like Alex, obviously, I don't know what you do professionally, um, but uh, the the way that I want to add to this is to talk about you know what you what anybody could probably do in a professional environment, and and then what they can do in their kind of like free time. Uh, so, in terms of uh, in a professional environment environment be willing to make yourself uncomfortable. And I'll share a story with you. Um, you know, one time, a long time ago, I used to work for the Federal Public Service and I was asked, um, you know, I don't want to like name names or anything, but I was asked to to write something into law that was really overtly racist. Uh, it's something that I knew as a researcher, policy researcher, I knew it would never make it into law because it was just a stupid policy. The, the policy was to target people at the border uh, who are Punjabi or ethnic Indians and, and then kind of search their trucks because there was the assumption that by the senior person that, um, you know, Punjabi truck drivers are smuggling things into the country. Uh, I was the only Indian person on the research team and I remember confronting my, my, my boss on this question and saying, you understand that this is completely insane, that we can't this is not a policy that the government of Canada should do. And he got really angry with me and he was yelling at me till he was red in the face. Uh, and then all of my other colleagues who were all white, uh, many of whom were more better educated and you know better positioned than I was in this organization. Uh, I was a I was a, at the time a federal work exchange student or something like that, really precariously employed. And they all just kind of shuffled their feet and like looked away and did everything that they could to avoid. Uh, acknowledging what was happening. So my advice to you is to not do that. You know, when when stuff like that happens, step up and be willing to put yourself in harm's way uh, and to be willing to put your career in harm's way uh, in order to, um, you know, like do what's right. Uh, that's general advice, I think, for anything. Like that's not just about race issues. Uh, and then the other thing I would say is, that, you know, the feeling of, of racial guilt is is real. But it's a feeling the uh, when we think about accountability as the sort of counterpoint to guilt, what's important about accountability is that it, it is an action, fundamentally an action. So, um, you know, you're welcome to feel guilt if you feel it. That's nothing that you can 
control. But at the end of the day, you shouldn't let a feeling of guilt or embarrassment uh, stop you from doing what is necessary to be accountable to uh, anti-racism if you're interested in becoming a, an anti-racist. But know that you cannot be an anti-racist simply by thinking things. Uh, you know, you have to actually be involved actively in doing stuff. Now, the next part of this is, well, I don't know how to get involved. I don't know what to do. And I faced this question, too. I remember like 12 years ago or so when I was first getting involved in, you know, the kinds of politics that I'm involved in. I didn't know what to do. Um, and I was organizing with feminists at the time. And I thought, well, you know, I don't really know what to do. I don't even know if it's my place to be offering my opinion in some of these discussions. So I turned up and I cooked. You know, I turned up and I did dishes. I turned up and I did childcare. I, I did the work that allowed other people who had the shared experience that was uh, under study. In this case, it was feminism. I, I did work reproductive labor so that they could do political labor. And uh, that is a huge, huge contribution that should never be under valued so you know if you see an event uh is, is coming up reach out to the organizers and say look i don't have any expertise here i want to support your work how can i support your work uh or or even better come with a proposal about how you'd want to support their work so that they don't have to do the labor of figuring out how you can do work for them uh so say you know i understand this is an event you're organizing uh in the afternoon uh I'd, i have the ability to do some child care if you like i can do that or i can bring some food or i can you know uh bring hand sanitizer you know you, there are ways to start getting involved and in building relationships with anti-racist communities um that can be hugely transformative uh for you and and for them too it's it's nobody is ever ever upset when um uh, people reach out to help um, they are sometimes upset if someone reaches out to help, but they expect to be, you know, have their hand held the whole way. So be prepared to be to feel uncomfortable and to lean into that discomfort because uh, that's part of anti-racist work. Uh, there's also lots of literature. Like if you, you know, there's a really popular book called How to Be an Anti-Racist by uh, Kendi, yeah, Ibram X. Kendi. There, and there's lots of where, you know, White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo, White Rage by Carol Anderson. Uh, Sonera Tabani has a really good book that's not overly accessible, but um, what's that one called? Anyway, that, that you can reach out to us for a bibliography. We definitely have lots of potential readings, but even more important than reading is actually doing the work because uh, you learn from doing it, uh, I think, even better than you learn from reading about it. Just don't tell our employers that we said that. So back to you, uh, Alex, for the next question. Thanks, AJ. Uh, all right, moving right along. Our next question. How do you talk about structural racism without saying structure 500 times in plain language? That's uh, that's a really good question. I think this, uh, this definitely comes back to what um, AJ was just saying about um, the difference between like ideas in our head and like actions in practice. So as a teacher, I always try to uh, make things as concrete and material as possible. At the end of the day, um, this is this is why I'm convinced doing the work that we're doing, uh, both in terms of uh, our political work, but also what we're doing here together, like in this live event, is important because we're actually doing something together. We're uh, thinking through things, talking together, learning, pushing forward, not just you know sort of sitting around with our thoughts and. I think uh, I share this frustration. I, I believe in the existence of structural or what, uh, or what I would call systemic racism, absolutely and definitively. Um, but I will not use that term more than once in any conversation because people will get entirely lost in it, right? It, it doesn't like what people will be like, well, what's, stru what's structure? Uh, and then you get into talking about the system and the system becomes a big code word for kind of everything wrong in the world. And, we're all, you know, we can all agree we're against the system. Even QAnon is against the system these days, right? Everybody dislikes the system. So uh, I, I don't ever talk about systems anymore. I don't like talking about systems. And at the end of the day, the world is really, as we know it, is made up of relations, right? Relations between people, between institutions, between ideas and practices. I'm much more comfortable talking about that. So if, if I want to talk, if I'm having a conversation either with a group of people or with somebody, about structural or systemic racism, I try to give as many specific examples of what I'm talking about as possible, right? So I might talk about the fact that, you know, black youth are six times more likely to be stopped on the street and carted by Halifax cops than white folks are. 
an example of systemic racism. That's not individual bad apples. That's not one officer who's a racist guy wandering around the city, making sure he stops every black kid he can find. That is across the population. That is a, a, a feature of the institution we know as the police. But the example that I gave before in, um, in, in answer to a previous question about the past system, right? Talking about how um, an indigenous person on reserve wasn't allowed to leave that specific territory. I mean, imagine if you if you are a white person and you live in Halifax or hereabouts, imagine not being able to leave your block without going to a government agent and getting permission to do that. I mean, to some extent, this is the kind of hysteria around the anti-mask stuff we're seeing these days being whipped up by the far right that people are up in arms about imagining being done to white people. Oh, now you're telling us in the pandemic we can't leave our homes. How dare you, my freedom of movement? Yeah, well, lots of other people's freedom of movement has always been restricted and, and regu regularly and rigorously so. Perfect example. Or we can talk about the distribution of you know, violence in society, who's most likely to be victimized by violent crime. We can talk about uh, the fact that Canada's immigration system was openly and uh, rather proudly racist well up through the 1970s with that point, with its point system, which favored European and especially Western European derived immigration and actively prevented black people and other racialized groups from immigrating to the country. And the list goes on and on and on. I mean, you can get into the laundry list of grievances too, obviously, on the other side of things. But what I encourage is the use of specific and material examples to prove the points we're making, right? So absolutely say the RCMP is an example of systemic racism. How can I prove that? Well, I can prove that by examining their treatment, for example, of indigenous land defenders, either in Wet'suwet'en or in El Sepogtug, versus their treatment of white fisher folk who are uh, you know, ramming boats, ramming indigenous fisher boats, cutting lines, uh, burning uh, 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 lobster storage facilities to the ground, and seeing the way that the the response is is entirely divergent and 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 attributable only to, like you know, any rational person anyway would only attribute it to the the identity of the people committing those acts. And so we stop talking about this thing, systemic racism or structural racism, which is, it's a very abstract idea. And we start talking about the specific and particular ways it manifests in our society. And we start discussing the issues that are behind that. And I think that's just a much more effective way of, uh, of moving forward. But I'll pass it over to AJ for his uh, contributions on this one too. Yeah, thanks for that. And thanks for the question. So I say structure probably like 500 times in any given conversation. It's almost like a running joke uh, amongst people who know me. So this one hits close to home. Uh, I, I think Alex is right, though. You know, like when we use words that people generally see as jargon, they're inclined immediately to just switch off. So kind of like what I was saying in response to the first question today is you need to do something that can disarm people uh, to catch their interest sometimes when you're trying to make a point. So uh, maybe just explain what structure is, you know, and that's a process of discovery. And every time I give a talk, I always find myself putting up the same slide eventually that says structure and agent and kind of like sociology 101, you know, like first understand what an agent is, then understand the structure and then see how they go together. That's not always useful, you know, if you're having a conversation at the water cooler or, or where have you, wherever you have conversations in person nowadays. Um, so I use other words sometimes, and I don't just mean whipping out a thesaurus, but, you know, like trying to think about uh, how can I get at this idea that this is not individualistic. And, and that's what I'm trying to get at when I say structure a thousand times, because white people in particular, in my experience, they have a tendency uh, because of structure, where they have a tendency to make everything individual about themselves. If somebody says something that I did was racist, it means that I am a racist. And that's a problem because anybody who is a product of a racist society is going to do racist things, myself included, every, you know, Alex included. So to dwell on the individual aspect of that is to depoliticize the whole project of learning and the whole project of thinking and doing differently. So I would hold on to the idea of structure and look for other ways to help uh, make the explanation. And one of the things that I do, I mean, I don't know if this is particularly helpful, but I talk about ontological assumptions and 
that, uh, even as I say that out loud, that's not helpful. Don't talk to anybody about ontology if you're trying to get through to them. Uh, but maybe ask them about what your starting assumptions are. How is it that you know what you know and why do you think that that's accurate? You know, so pose it as a question. And what you can do, uh, what I do anyway, is I eventually try and trace that lineage back all the way to kind of like where the origins are, which oftentimes you'd be surprised how many of them end up back at the uh, at the at the book of Genesis, um, at least in the kind of Western dominated world. I'm not a I'm not a theologian or anything like that, but um, honestly, if you look at John Locke, who's the kind of guy who uh, really we based a lot of our assumptions about what property and law and land ought to be. Uh, if you read his book five property um, on in the book, the second treaties on government, all of his footnotes basically take you back to the book of Genesis. I mean, that's his evidence. And he uses the trope of the state of nature and this absurd ideas about like, you know, how race operates before people were talking about race at all. But that's there. It's in there and it's woven into the law as a result of that. So we're really asking them the question, how is it that you know the things that you come to believe are true? What are the starting assumptions that you all have? Everybody has them, but not everything is an ontology. What makes ontology different from just some dude's opinion uh, is that it's a system of knowledge. It's a system uh, on which you can build epistemologies and ways of knowing the world uh, on top of those assumptions. But when those assumptions you know, are organized to silence the experiences and knowledges of the rest of the world, that's when you got a problem. So start that, try that, you know, there's, there's no right fit and in any given conversation that you have, you may need to use one, two, four or five different techniques and know that you're not going to change anybody's mind necessarily in a single conversation. So are you willing to have a long standing relationship with that person to do that? So I'll pass it back to you, Alex, for the next question. Uh, thanks, AJ. That was a really worthwhile reflection. I too am guilty of using jargon all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's uh, let's move right along. Okay, this is a quick one. Uh, can you recommend a go-to book on racism in Canada? Uh, well, as AJ was just saying, he rattled off a few great ones. Uh, not all of them uh, are specific to Canada, obviously, but um, we we would love to share the stuff we're reading with you. We're happy to do that. I'm going to just, I'll name drop two that come to mind right now um, that I, I've read in the last few years that I think are absolutely core reading for every Canadian uh, right now. And the first one is Desmond Cole's The Skin We're In. Um, his, his new book just came out uh, a few months ago is an amazing, readable, tour de force, uh, personal, but also systematic account of anti-Black, anti-BIPOC racism in Canada uh, that does not engage in the kind of spectacle of, um, of liberal identity politics or, or, or guilt. Um, it really is like a, a thorough, but absolutely amazing um, uh, account of the experience of being primarily of being black in a in a white supremacist society over the course of a year and he basically takes a year and and goes month by month talking about some of the the outstanding uh totally horrifying events that happen over the course of that year and uh, grappling with them as a person of color in this country um uh, i highly recommend it it's just so wonderful and if you're not following desmond cole um on social media and you're on social media like you should do that he's he's an amazing voice on this the other one I'd recommend right now is um, Robin Maynard's book, Policing Black Lives, uh, which which is like an amazing historical correction to so many of the myths that we are fed. If you grew up in this country, if you were born or, or raised or from an early age in this country and were fed all the nonsense that we get in school, um, then like there is there is no book I think out there right now that's better about correcting the historical record in Canada. Everything from like were there slaves here to what does the character of anti-black, anti-indigenous uh, racism look like here? How is that elaborated? How has that been unleashed? What does that look like for trans people, for gender non-conforming people, for poor people who are also racialized? Amazing. So Robin Maynard's Policing Black Lives. Desmond Cole's uh, The Skin We're In. Those would be, those would be my two uh, top ones right now, and I'll, I'll pass it over to AJ for his uh, recommendations. 
Yeah, thanks for that. So <laughs> you have asked two professors about their favorite books. So we could definitely we could take the rest of the hour talking about this. But I'm really I get excited when uh, when when people ask questions like this. Just looking at the things that are directly in front of me right now. This is what I've been reading lately. Uh, and I, uh, so this is the truth that Wampom tells by an Anishinaabe scholar named Lynn Gale. Uh, this is her latest book I haven't read yet called Claiming, Claiming Anishinaabe. Um, I, I really think that reading indigenous books written by indigenous scholars in particular is, is a really useful starting point. And to these ones, I would also add um, Redskins, White Masks by Glenn Coltard, a Dene political scientist um, in the West Coast. Um, I would add Unsettled Expectations by Eva Mackey. Um, what else did I jot down here? Alex said a bunch of them as well. Um, uh, I, I think that's, oh no, and then uh, two books by Leanne Simpson, another Anishinaabe, brilliant Anishinaabe scholar, uh, one called um, Lighting, Lighting the, I have it here somewhere, Lighting the Eighth Fire, Lighting the Seventh Fire, Lighting a Fire from 2007 anyway, uh, and then this, uh, the other one is called As We Have Always Done. Uh, and what's amazing about a lot of these indigenous scholars, oh, also uh, Tayage Alfreds is a classic, um, uh, what is, it's an indigenous manifesto, um, uh, an indigenous manifesto, I forget the tagline anyway, but Tayage Alfred, 1999. Uh, a lot of these books, I would say, are really great because they they start right away from uh, articulating a theoretical understanding of this territory that doesn't take Canada as its starting point. And I can't stress enough how important it is to uh, to, to decenter Canada and, and British Empire when you're trying to understand the conditions that have led to Can the, the, this territory, because we're talking thousands of years of political development. So understanding the, the, the multiple uh, perspectives on indigeneity is hugely important. Um, other ones that I would add um, are The Hanging of Angelique uh, and Black Matters, which is a brand new one. Both of them are authored by uh, our, my, our, my colleague here in the history department, um, Afua Cooper. Um, and what else did I have here? You know, I could go on forever, but the last point I would say is what you, as you start to read these things, you're going to start to notice that there are certain publishers that make it their, their priority to privilege these kinds of uh, conversations and they go to great lengths to ensure that they're publishing uh, dissident and critical voices. And there's lots of different publishers, uh, not enough, but lots of different publishers who do this. Um, Alex and I both have kind of like somewhat long uh, relationships with Fernwood uh, Publishing, which is based here uh, as well as in, in, in Winnipeg. And they have a lot of really great book series that focus exactly on these issues. And many of the books, in fact, that we talked about were published by Fernwood. Another one I would add to that, though not written by Indigenous authors, is Policing Indigenous Movements, uh, which is a brilliant piece uh, written by a couple of friends of mine uh, based in Ottawa. Um, but anyway, Fernwood's not the only one. ARP Press, um, you know, uh, University of Regina Press has some really good work. And the University of Minnesota as well produces really great work, uh, particularly on Indigenous politics. Um, 500 Years of Indigenous Resistance was the other one I wanted to mention, which is also available as a comic book by uh, a West Coast uh, Indigenous artist named Gord Hill, who is an incredible, incredible human being um, in many, many ways. So, you know, we could even start a reading group. That would be fantastic. So uh, we better we better stop there. Otherwise, we'll we'll talk for the forever about books. So why don't you take the next question, Alex? Sure, um, OK, the next question. Hi there. Thanks so much for supporting us all with this work. I'm a white cisgender female currently reflecting on the ways in which my privilege has benefited me personally and professionally. I'm a nurse and work in adolescent mental health. I am part of a predominantly white anti-racism working group trying to address racism in the work that we do. We have been trying to inform ourselves about the ways racism impacts mental health care and mental illness. We want our work to be informed by the lived experiences of BIPOC, but don't want to burden them with fixing our problems. Do you have any suggestions on how we can do that? 
So this is a this is a great and really rich question. Uh, first of all, I would just say thanks for doing the work that you're doing in your in your profession. This sounds like a vital area of of work. Um, it's great to hear like a concrete example of somebody working outside of, you know, sort of this the, where AJ and I work in the university, but working in, in healthcare, who's part of an anti-racist working group and who's trying to figure out these solutions. I mean, to some extent, I would say it sounds like you're doing <laughs> what you need to be doing. Um, it sounds like you're coming together to identify problems and propose solutions in your own professional environment. I guess if you're asking how we think or how I think you might access uh, BIPOC insights, I would say uh, to some extent, I'm gonna go back to the reading issue and um, and suggest that there are some really great works out there uh, that have focused on this question around mental health, racialization and, and systematic injustice. I mean, you really can't throw a stone these days without um, hitting somebody talking about the connection between state violence, um, uh, uh, racialized bodies and mental health. So once again, just the other day, you know, we've had a police officer acquitted of all criminal charges in Ottawa for killing a mentally ill black person outside his apartment building, beating him to death with his uh, reinforced combat gloves. In the States, another black man just killed the other day by police who fired some like 13 rounds into him Again, a man in mental health crisis uh, who clearly didn't didn't need to be killed uh, to keep the rest of us safe. Uh, so many examples, right, of um, not only racialization provoking mental illness, but also the compounding effects of uh, facing the uh, the the capacity or the the reality of state sanctioned violence. Uh, because you are a racialized person and because you're in mental health distress. So uh, this is something Robin Maynard in her book, Policing Black Lives, talk, writes about extensively, something that Desmond Cole uh, writes about in his book extensively too. Uh, I would say those are wonderful places to start. If you are just, if it's, it sounds to me from reading your question like you're, you're a bit beyond the reading stage, to be honest, but I don't want to suggest I know your life. Um, it, it does sound like you've been working on these issues for some time, but if you're coming to them or if you have colleagues in these groups and you're trying to grapple with these issues, I think, you know, uh, starting starting a conversation by offering one of these readings as a way to kickstart that discussion is great and presents you with the lived experiences of people without asking people around you who are maybe in crisis at that moment to explain themselves to you. On the other hand, I think there's no better way to do this work than by inviting people who are directly affected by these issues to be a part of their solutions. Um, if your working group has the capacity to offer honoraria to invited speakers to come in and talk to your group, you know, without having any necessary long term commitment to the work that you're doing internally, that's a way to begin. You know, invite people who are part of the, if you are enga engaged in the community, if you're not, then reach out to the groups around you who you know of who do this work already and ask them if they would suggest speakers who might come in and tell them that you're willing to offer an honoraria. If you're not part of a formal organization, but you're all nurses, you're all professionals, you're professors like me and AJ, then pass the hat and come up with an honorarium, you know? This is one of the things that I think people working in fairly secure, sectors right now and those of us who are lucky enough to have like non precarious work need to be doing just at a basic level like my university is a fairly threadbare institution in a lot of ways there's not a lot of institutional support for this but hey i'm a professor my colleagues are professors if we're gonna hold an event like this then that person should get paid for their time right let's invite them in you're not tokenizing them if you're actually like Lift, providing them with a platform to say what they want to say to you and then also compensating them for their time and wisdom. That's a good thing you're doing. So, uh, I mean, I'm really wary, I think, of um, saying uh, sort of like across the board that you should never engage or never invite people in because you're afraid of tokenizing them. I think well-intentioned white people uh, can do a lot that isn't tokenistic that still involves engaging the knowledge that comes out of those communities. So um, because I'm cognizant of time right now and I want to pass it over to AJ, that's where I'm going to leave it. But it's a great question and, and thank you for the work you're doing. Yeah, thanks for that. I uh, I think Alex really nailed it there. I don't have much to add aside from, you know, just 
since you mentioned that you're in the medical field, I would I don't know if you're based in the East Coast or you could be coming from anywhere really at this point, but uh, two two uh, people that I know really well who are doing really good anti-racist work uh, in the medical profession and, and they've written about this and they're doing like some organizing work around it too. So you can Google um, Dr. Aruna Dara, uh, who's a physician um, here in the East Coast, as well as Dr. Gaynor Watson Creed who is also based in the East Coast. She's also an associate dean at the med school here at Dow and uh, deputy chief medical officer in, in Nova Scotia. And these two women uh, in particular, there are others of course too. Oh, um, Amishere Dryden, uh, the uh, chair in um, Black Studies here as well. Um, you know, there, there are really good people who are doing really good work that is of particular uh, interest, I think, to health professionals in terms of uh, anti-racist work in the health profession. So definitely reach out to those cats and, you know, um, like Alex said, invite them to your organization, um, you know, pay them or offer to pay them an honorarium. And if they have a salary, then maybe offer to redirect that honorarium to a, a worthy cause. That's something that many, many speakers are, are always happy to do, um, especially if they have stable income. But but many of the people who are doing amazing work in this field are not, don't have the privilege of having a stable income. So, you know, speaker fees and honoraria, I just want to highlight how important that is in terms of supporting and not tokenizing people's work. It is the minority of us who are, uh, you know, like have comfortable jobs. And that's one of the reasons why Alex and I are, are, are doing work like this. And uh, just before I pass it back, I just also wanted to uh, say that in the comment section here, uh, Tafit Duggan has also added some really great recommendations. My conversations with Canadians by Lee Maracle and We Were Not the Savages by Dan Paul. Excellent books indeed. So uh, why don't I pass it back to you, Alex? And I think the last question there is also by Tafit, and it's it's a really important one. So you can take first crack at that. Sure. Uh, thanks, AJ. Yeah, and this will be our last question for this session. Uh, we're almost at 1.30 now. And then I'll pass it back to AJ for his final comments on this one and just uh, to, to sign us off. Um, but uh, it's a great question. The question is, should you really put your career, your neck, on the line when it comes to speaking against your boss or administration when it comes to speaking against racist policies? Um, you know, I've got a really simple answer to this. Yeah, you should, absolutely. Um, I feel like it's incumbent upon each of us to understand that all this that we are surrounded by, all this architecture of inequality, exploitation, oppression and violence only happens because the rest of us participate in its daily reproduction. And that's not to make us all feel endlessly guilty, but it's like, you know, I say about society, my intro to anthro class, I'm like you get out of bed every morning, you decide, you don't really consciously decide, but you do to play by all the rules, right? You go out, you go about, you go, you get dressed, you don't, you don't wear your superhero costume, you don't drive on the wrong side of the road, you don't start fist fights on the street, you play by all the normal social conventions. And most of us don't think of that as doing anything uh, other than like, you know, doing what you're supposed to be doing, um, you know, painting by numbers, working out the habit. But if you didn't do that, if enough of us didn't do that, then this thing called society wouldn't happen, right? So it's our complicity in that, and that those are good things. I don't wanna start fist fights. I don't wanna drive on the wrong side of the road. I don't wanna cause unnecessary trouble for people. That's all great. But when the systems we are talking about are racist, misogynist, trans, and queerphobic, all these kinds of things, then it's really very much incumbent upon us to decide what our lines are, right? And I would say for everybody, obviously, this is a question you need to ask yourself. Now, not every struggle in the workplace ought to be, ought to cause you to draft your letter of resignation and to hand it to your boss. You know, I move, you know, I want, I want this done differently, otherwise I'm out of here. But there are absolutely lines that I've personally decided that in my own workplace are are lines I'm not ever willing to, to cross, even at the cost of my employment. Um, and those lines have yet to be pushed upon me, but I would say absolutely, like that, that that's, that's, that's a, a very firm line in my mind that I've, that I've established that I'm not willing to go beyond. Um, and we, we owe it to our, ourselves and the world that we inhabit to do that. So yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm just gonna leave it there to give AJ enough time to, to offer a quick response too. Um, but yeah, go for it, AJ. 
Yeah, thanks, Alex. And thanks for this really important question that, uh, you know, I think does follow up on some of what we were saying earlier. Um, I guess, like, I, I agree in principle with what Alex said, but I have, a, a like, a, a slight nuance to that in that it really, like, to some extent, it has to depend on the circumstances that you find yourself in, right? Because... Um, if you are taking care of people, if you if, if that job that you have, whatever it is, you know, whether you work at the grocery store or whether you work at uh, the university or what have you, you have you you know you have to be able to look after the people in your life. Um, so not everything, like like Alex said, not everything is is the hill worth dying on. Um, but you do have to have a kind of ethical disposition about how you go about doing things and, and understand that. Uh, part of what makes the system operate the way it does is the fact that everybody is afraid of their bosses. You know what I mean? And um, we shouldn't be afraid of our bosses because our bosses are useless without us. Um, and if you're concerned about being, you know, victimized by the boss for articulating something like that, there are strategies organize with other workers, you know, like uh, if you're not part of a union, uh, form a union, start talks about forming a union, reach out to um, uh, different kind of union organizers and that sort of thing and and find power in, in your uh, relationship to your means of production, whatever that is. Uh, and realize that when you speak against racism, you're not speaking alone, even though in that moment you feel alone, but you've got generations of people behind you generations of people in front of you who are supporting the work that you are doing and the sacrifices that you're willing to make. So although it can feel lonely, um, there are more people with you than you than you know. Uh, and it's a question about like thinking about how to reach out to them so that when you speak to truth to the power in that way, you speak with a sort of collective fist as opposed to a singular one. Uh, and with that, we we are at time. Thank you so much, everyone, for these really wonderful questions, exciting questions. Uh, we hope that you've gotten something useful out of this, that you'll tune in uh, next month when we do it. Uh, I'll keep sharing everything uh, on Facebook. Um, seems to be the easiest way for everybody to get a copy of the link. We will make a video recording of today's session available shortly, hopefully by next week on uh, YouTube. And I'll post that link to the Facebook page for this event at the same time starting next month's uh, Facebook event. So thank you so much. Please uh, keep up the good work and uh, we will see you again next month.